So your first customer is really, really special and your customers will guide you. So when I was at the startup, I was at Golden Gate Software, started when there were 40 people, we had good customers. These customers helped us mature the product and they gave us free guidance and advice. So I would say, look, in whatever form you can, you need to think about the customer in the product design, that your first customer is like gold, your second customer is a little more gold, right? You got it, and you got to use them and build a relationship so you can hear from them. How did that go? Is that working well? What would you recommend? What other use cases do you have? What else do you think we should do? But if you can start with this voice of the customer, you will be very, very, very successful. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Zero to Exit. This is Ankur and Nilima. So far on this podcast, we've had CEOs, VCs, product and go-to-market leaders, but we are yet to have someone cover a critical function in a startup's journey, and that's customer success. In SaaS business, as they say, 100% of your time should be spent on customer retention. This is because about two-thirds of your business over time will come from renew and expand, and you got to pay attention to it. To help explain the customer success function, how to navigate often the difficult and stressful conversations with customers on product escalations, on expand and churn, we're fortunate to have with us Lisa Schreiber, currently a chief customer success officer at Forcepoint, and there's a twist to the story, so you got to tune in, a global leader in cybersecurity. Lisa has spent over two decades in customer success leadership roles at Oracle, Golden Gate Software, and other companies driving hundreds of millions of revenues in renew and expand businesses. Lisa and I met just last week on the flight from Houston to San Francisco. We talked about customer success, negotiations, exec communication, managing up, down, sideways. And I knew right away that I had to have her on the show. And here we are. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the show. Hi, Ankur. Thank you so much. And it's so nice to see you again. And you're not sitting next to me um, <laughs> on the airplane, but uh, you look well rested. It's good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks a lot for coming on the show on such a short notice. I know you were returning from a mini vacay when we met. Looks like, you know, where you went. I mean, you know, they've, they've obviously relaxed a lot of COVID related restriction due to the drop in COVID cases. How was your trip uh, to Cancun, I think? I flew out of Cancun. I started in Merida, and then I ended up in uh, Chichen Itza, Holbosch, and then I flew out of Cancun. It was a great trip. It was in between jobs. Yes. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. It was uh, very relaxing and felt very comfortable. I felt very comfortable in Mexico. Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad to see people are starting to go out and about. I think the nightmare that was COVID is uh, about to be over, and we can kind of do fun things. And it's definitely, you recommended a couple of places in the vicinity. It's going to be definitely on my bucket list. So, you know, in our conversation, when we were chatting on the flight, uh, you mentioned that you come from humble beginnings. Tell us a little bit more about your childhood and upbringing, specifically the the things that you learned growing up, uh, both personally and professionally, that has sort of carried and over the last three decades. Thanks for that question. And you know, it's near and dear to my heart to talk about some of these things. And I have children, I know you have children, and you think about what experiences are they getting. For me, I grew up in a small paper mill town in Western Pennsylvania, where everyone knew everybody. And my family were third generation Pennsylvanians. And my father was a great, he was a very good outdoorsman. I would say he was an expert outdoorsman. Um, He was in the army, and then he ended up being the science teacher at my high school. And my mother, who was well-educated also, went back to school when she, after she had three girls and got her degree and um, was a speech therapist. So they were both in education and they cared about education and that that carried through to the family. Now, we didn't have we didn't have a lot and it's funny you just didn't realize you didn't have a lot and I still laugh we still own the little house we grew up in my sisters and I do. There's still no shower. Look, this is not a hard <laughs> story. It's just the way it was and we three girls learned how to to manage all this. But It's this idea that you build resilience through your experiences and through kind of the the character that your parents passed down, right? So they gave us curiosity, education, and then also this idea of trying. I had more skin knees than you can count, but it was really because we were out trying things and doing things. And my father, who didn't have any boys, I became his oldest son. And so I got the experience of a lot of his outdoorsmen skills 
um, which was really great for me. My mother was a great homemaker, so I got a lot of the homemaking skills from her. So it was great to just have this variety of skills, and I rely on them now. Does this also help with hunger to do well? It does, and I'll give you an interesting story. I used to be the CIO at U.S. Trust, and they they dealt with the top one percent of the wealthy in the U.S. and they did a study on generational wealth. So if you're really wealthy and you have children, like how do they feel about wealth and what's their motivation to do well? And when children don't think they can do better than the parents, they lose motivation. I felt that if I applied myself and I was very proud of my parents that I could also succeed. And that did help with my motivation. It's a great question, Melina. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, your story definitely reminds me a lot of the, I was just reading about the Watch Kiki sisters, uh, YouTube CEO and her sister's also a CEO in another company, uh, 23 and twenty three and me, yeah. Big yeah. fan, yep. Yeah, totally. I'll pivot to now your career. You've been running customer success before it was a thing. People understand customer support, but at some point the tech industry caught on to the idea of customer success. Tell our listeners what the difference is and what the real customer success brings to the table for our customers. So the the difference is this. Customer success cares about are you the value you're receiving from the product? How quickly can you get to, to that value? How quickly can you see that you can get to first value and full value? And to me, support tries to keep you at that value level if you run into other issues. In the past with on-premise software, all of the responsibility was on the customer. If they didn't install it well, if they didn't have the right technical understanding, if they didn't have enough hardware, right? It was all their fault, all their fault. That is all gone. It is no longer the customer's fault if they aren't getting the value for the software. Now, look, there's certainly a customer component, but it's so much smaller. It's really on the company, the SaaS company, to be sure that they've made it easy to use and easy for customers to consume. So they look like the heroes they should be for choosing that company and that solution. Does a company need both customer support and customer success? Boy, in a perfect world, I would like to get rid of support. I would like to have error-free software. (laughs) Um, And I think we could get there. I know, I know, I know. I would like to get rid of all customer cases. But at the end of the day, however you set this up, the customer needs to be able to use your product for to solve their business problem, and they need to be able to rely on it. So if you don't need customer support because you can do it all through other means, whatever that setup is, but it's a whole continuum and you need to be sure the customer is taken care of. And the most important time is this time called reputation threatening events. People will call them sub one, sub one, sub two. I care about when our customer's reputation is on the line and yeah. have we are we ready to help them in the way that they need it, as quickly as they need it. Because remember, with SaaS products, the customer has given up all control. Now, I told you before, it was very hard to get products installed in the old world, right? But they had all the employees, and when there was an emergency, they could say to all of them, you know, stay here until it's fixed, and they would. Now they're counting on you to stay there until it's fixed, and you have to demonstrate that. And you have to show them that they're just not one of a million or one of a hundred that you care about them and their business. And this is what's going to make them successful and you successful. Yeah, very well said. The other day I was looking at the Salesforce's uh, last quarterly results. And one of the testament to the fact that the customer success is becoming such a critical function is the fact that Salesforce, I think their service cloud revenue and the growth exceeds their sales cloud now. So it just kind of gets to show how much importance, not only is it for Gainside and Salesforce, but the customers are spending money on buying software kind of to use the customer success function. Now, in your experience, you know, does both renew and expand fall in the success bucket or that's still dealt with by the sales teams? Like, what have you seen? Has there been a paradigm shift in our industry? I think there's a shift, but I think they can be, so I don't care where they sit in the organization. We all need to care. I've worked in organizations where the renewal function is not very mature and it needs to still stay in sales. I've worked in companies where it's very mature and it blends very easily in with customer success. I've worked in both models and I think you can focus on both. It really is, are you delivering the value to the customer and are you bringing great products to market? You're going to lose in renewals just on two cases. 
One is the customer. If you're doing great things and the customer doesn't know what it is, they're going to go to some new great thing. Like someone's going to be knocking on their door saying, can't you try something else? And you won't know this because it's, there's so much digital discovery now. A salesperson doesn't have to knock on the door of your company to sell you a product. And I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example. If I was in HR, and let's say I'm a director in HR and I want new HR software, and uh, maybe I'll go out and I'll look at Workday and I'll look at others, success factors, give me the list, right? I will weigh them, understand how they work. I may even try them out if they give me a chance. And I can probably also do the financial cost analysis before I ever go to the head of human resources. In the yeah. past, the salesperson would go to the head of human resources and try and convince that person that you need this. Now it's coming up from below. And there's the salespeople didn't see it coming. Now, there's probably someone who was watching the website who said, oh, look, this company seems to be pretty interested in what we have. Let's see if we can reach out to them. I, th I think this is where sales engineers are really, really critical. You can have some salespeople connected to the website. This is where I think support's really critical. If they're going to test drive my product, I want them to have a terrific experience doing it because, again, they're making the decision before all of this. But let me get back. You were talking about renew and expand, but it's this idea that you can lose them even when you don't, you don't even know you're losing them because they're out there researching it because that's what the digital transformation is providing them. And then, the, so the renew piece, they'll continue to renew if they're happy and you're meeting their business requirements and they feel like heroes. And they'll expand if they know where you're going and they have more business to be solved, more business problems to be solved. And they're so confident in you and what you're delivering that they believe what you tell them and they'll buy more. So it's that it's the delivery of the promise of your product. Yeah. A related thing here, should customer success carry any kind of quota on renewal side? So I've run renewals at scale. So I'm pretty familiar with renewals. I ran all of um, North America renewals for Oracle, which was a multi-billion dollar business. And I did put CSMs on commission there. The difficulty is that some customers, depending on their renewal cycle and where they are in the year, and if there's other things at play, can cause difficulty for the CSM who may be performing perfectly. So you have to figure out what the balance is. But lately, I like them to be bonused on the renewal number. So I do think they need to be tied, whether you put them on the sales plan or you put them on a bonus plan. I think it depends on your company but they definitely need to, to care about it. And one model that I particularly like right now, you still need a true salesperson chasing down that renewal. You do. Now, they can have some CSM DNA in them. So they can look at how the customer has been interacting with your company. Are they opening tickets? Are they checking in? Or have they just stopped calling you? What's their usage? Are they using as many seats as they've signed up for? That kind of thing. Likewise, I think the CSM needs to have a little bit of sales DNA so they understand that being sales savvy helps the entire company. If there's a fork in the road, I've talked about this quite frequently, the CSM has a choice between doing A or doing B. And CSMs, of course, are trying to help out the customer and so they like to be liked by the customer and of course we like that. If you give them added like focus on the financial aspects of your company and what it takes for the company to be successful, Hopefully, when there's a fork in the road, they'll take the one that's more financially advantageous to you. Now, I don't mean that they are only care about the numbers, but it just there's so much variability in their job day to day that I just like to see that as more of a focus. So the model we were working on in my last company is that 120 days out, the CSM and the sales rep meet with the customer and they're like, hey, here's all the value you've had all year. The CSMs had all these conversations all year long in whatever form, electronic, whatever. The customer should really know their value and we should know if they're getting value or not, because if they're not, we have to do other, we should have been doing other things. The salesperson is on the call and there's a quick interlock. If the customer's like, yeah, I've got it planned. It's in the budget. No problem. Then you know the renewal is fine. The CSM can just go about their regular business and continue that. If it's not and there's questions, I want the CSM and the renewal rep to stick with that customer until those questions are satisfied. Now, 120 days out is really three months. Do you want to do it six months out? You can pick any time you want. But the CSM's view should always be this continuous, I'm keeping the customer happy. I don't. They don't really care when the renewal is because they're keeping the customer happy. I don't like to see organizations that say, oh, if the renewal's coming up, 
Yeah, hang on. I heard Head Engineering say this. Yeah. If you know what's coming up, tell me because I'll put their stuff to the top of the list. I'm like, that's old thinking. If that's the only time you're putting your stuff to the top of the list, you've lost the customer because they've made the decision to leave you more than three or six months in advance because they have to plan. Absolutely. You need to treat them well all the time. Very well said and, and couldn't agree more with that. One of the things that you touched upon a couple of times is to demonstrate value, which seems like a disease that is specific to security in that, that we have to constantly demonstrate value. Two questions. Why is this demonstrating value unique to security business? And what have you seen works both from a product standpoint and from a CS standpoint, uh, you know, when you're having these conversation, your QBRs, et cetera, where you can tell them that, hey, this is the value. So kind of two-part question. So, so it is a little bit around security, but you know, I could argue there's other companies and in my new company, when we, you'll have to tell me when we talk about them, Yeah. Um, they have to get the customer up and running on their SaaS software to demonstrate value to, but let's go back to security. If um, a drugstore wants to secure remote drugstores, right? There's a drugstore in my neighborhood and there's a drugstore in your neighborhood and one in the Lima's neighborhood. When they get up on your security software, that's a first value. Not all, it's not all their, it's not all their, their yeah. drugstores, right? But they need to see that. And then they're like, okay, it works. Like I kind of put my reputation on the line to get this project funded. And now I can see that it works, right? And then the rest of them. And it's how fast you can help get them there. Does, what do you do at Palo Alto Networks? Like, how do you guys look at it? Yeah, great question. I think the first time to value is hard, but it's easier compared to the second piece, which is I've got the customer up and running. Now the operator is kind of logging in the product once in a while, getting the sensors, but then demonstrating that day in and day out, quarter over quarter, up at the renewal time is always a challenge. Like, you know, you got to give them like 15 different dashboards and then customers all confused. And that's where I was like, how do you consistently demonstrate value? Because, you know, it's it, unlike productivity tools where people are slacking and stuff like that. There's just nothing every day that you can show that that's where sort of some of the difficulties are. And, you know, I wanted to see if caught on to certain ideas where the product can consistently show value. I do. And let me give you a good example. I was meeting with the CISO of an extremely large telco in the U.S. And yeah. uh, the team was able to show him, and we were just starting this. So it's the idea of the executive dashboard. So let me step back and I'll explain it. And I love the power of this, that you need, look, our customers have some of the hardest jobs. Really, we have to have that kind of compassion for them. Yeah. And so when it comes to demonstrating value, it's not showing the network security administrator, although it is important that they see it, but it's not only that job. It's that the people who go after the funding for your product can articulate the value of that product. And I like to hand them the slides that I hope they use at the board meeting to show that value. So with the CISO, we showed them how many threats we had averted. Yeah. And we put a dollar figure on it of 6 million. He thought it was in the ballpark. He was fine. It was the first time we tested this. It was just a few months ago. He thought it was in the ball. He really, really liked it. And I've done this with other customers. I had a very large bank in New York City and I started showing them kind of their usage compared to their peers and that kind of thing. And I know those slides were cut and pasted into other decks within the company and I couldn't have been more proud they don't have time to often pull that together, but we can see it. If we can't make that argument for the executives that have purchased our software, and we, we should be, I'm not even gonna say if we can't, we can't, but we should be able to do that. Everyone can benefit from that. Yeah. And I find that to be really powerful. That's one of my, the favorite things that I like to do. Yeah, what we have seen is the value articulation is not same for even the two same set of users, right? So a financial, person who's doing automation, they will see it very differently than a healthcare threat analyst looking at the same data. At the end of the day, we need to have three or four variations of that so that we can help them. One of the, obviously this podcast is for all kinds of people, but the main consumer is startups. When should startups start thinking about having a customer success function? You know, initially first 20, 30, it's product people are running around and sales people are running around. When should they start thinking about building this function? Right from the start. <laughs> Spoken like a seasoned CCO. <laughs> here's, here's the deal. So your first customer is really, really special and your customers will guide you. So when I was at the startup, I was at Golden Gate Software, started when there were 40 people. We had good customers. 
these customers helped us mature the product and they gave us free guidance and advice. So I would say, look, in whatever form you can, you need to think about the customer in the product design, that your first customer is like gold. Your second customer is a little more gold, right? You got it and you've got to use them and build a relationship so you can hear from them. How did that go? Is that working well? What would you recommend? What other use cases do you have? What else do you think we should do? Look, I know you're going to have really smart product managers, really smart engineers, but if you can start with this voice of the customer, you will be very, very, very successful. I used to, look, I ran engineering for a while at Golden Gate Software and I would go out with the customers. I would learn things. There was a story, DirecTV down in LA. We were having some issues with the product and I had to go down and talk to the CIO, <laughs> which was fine. He was a great partner of ours. As I'm down there and I'm going up in the elevator, they have data about reliability of their systems and the issues that they've had because they're trying to keep everyone focused on highly available systems. Well, Golden Gate Software helped you with highly available systems, but they weren't using it as that use case. So not only did I get to go into the CIO's office and we dealt with the issue at hand, then I said, you know, I was coming up in the elevator and I, he goes, yeah, it's a problem. I said, I can help you with three of those four outages because they had the issue right in the elevator. And we sold another $1.5 million just because you're just on your toes and you're thinking about your customer and you're trying to figure out how else you can help them. So you have to, getting to know your customer and the first one that buys it, I really, I'd give them an award. I would treat them so well. The other piece is when I was at Golden Gate Software, because I ran the customer side, I was often brought into the sales cycle because these were large, Many of them were large banks that needed mission critical support because these are mission critical systems using this database replication. They wanted to know who was running support could stand up behind them and really take care of them. And I could, you put me in front of a customer, I had a small but mighty team and I used to run, I used to work at these banks. I knew exactly what they needed and I could explain it to them. And there was never a question as to what we could deliver for them. Great answer. When we go from 100 customers to 1,000 customers to tens of thousands of customers, how does the CS role change at a different stage of the company? So this is complex and a little controversial. Not all customers are equal. You <laughs> may need to leave some customers that you don't want to leave, but your business model won't let you keep them. I've been at a company where we had very large customers, multi-million dollar customers, and then we had many, many, many really, really small customers. Now, look, I would like to take all customers with me. And at the small end, I think there's a large self-service offering you need to come up with. The business model is really important. You can't put a CSM on every account and you can't service every customer as though they're your largest customer, although you would like to. So the extent to which you can offer electronic self-service advice that's really high quality, you should. You need to, it's like table stakes. You need to get the best tools in there and help them help themselves. Be there when you can, that's reasonable, but when you yeah. can't be honest about it. Um, I've been in places where we've changed the SLA for the very smallest customers and they've become unhappy and so have the salespeople. As a matter of fact, I've been on more calls with salespeople who said, look, this 15 or $30,000 customer may not renew with us because you just changed the SLAs. Well, I changed the SLAs because I'm favoring the top 80%. It's not even 80, the top 10% that brings me 80% of my revenue. And the rest of them get a graduated level of service. And of course I feel for that small customer, but they were using us as their tech support team. I mean, their, their internal technology team. We can no longer answer those basic questions. So they either need to buy up into a better level of support or if they can't afford us, they need to find a, a better solution that's more cost effective for them. And that hurts. And the salesperson's like, well, you're hurting my commission. And I'm like, okay, I get it's about you. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but I get that you care about that. I get that you care about the company, but sometimes you have to get a better customer and you have to yeah. leave the other behind, right? What have you guys found out? Nalima, you have a lot of experience around this, I think. <laughs> The, the reason I ask is because I've done customer success myself for three years and I, I understand and align with the feel for every customer. We do struggle with, okay, how do we classify that 10% to 80% and where do we invest? I'll give you a quick approach on that. 
I would say I would let support and renewals pick the largest customers. Let's say let's say you want to get to the the group of customers that's eighty percent of your revenue. Yep. And then I would save a bunch of seats for sales, and I would say, okay, sales, you can put so many of your strategic customers in here because that's their point. Lisa, I have the next PayPal. And they're only going to spend thirty thousand dollars with us, but they're the next PayPal. Like, can we bring them in? I'm so I give them room, and I let them decide, and I stop the argument, and we change it twice. We look at it twice a year. They're not happy with it, and I also coach them to upsell the customers into better levels of support. We have levels of support, and they know how to do that. They're in sales. This can be done. They just need to know it's important. You talked about giving the sales people some tokens and make trade off. Do you ask your product people? to give you tokens in terms of the features that you want them to prioritize? This is such a hard space. <laughs> so you're <laughs> smiling and you both, look at, you both know this is a hard space. Look, product people care about the customer yeah. and they care about new features. As a company, and this is where the CEO's role is really important, if the CEO cares more about new features, they will have very little left over to allocate for maintenance and for customer requested features. You need to find a way to effectively lobby your case and you need to find the business reasons behind it. And then just so I'm not left alone on a call with a customer, if I know it's going to be about a feature that they want, I'll bring the product managers in with me. Look, it's a cooperative way to do it, but I want them to feel the call, the customer, the business case, like pull them in, bring them to your side. They should be part of your team anyway. This needs to be a close working relationship it sometimes takes time. And I've told this story before. I've sometimes had the critical accounts team have quite a long list of things that need to be addressed. And we will triage them based on, you know, is the customer in that 80% of revenue or not, and try to help engineering allocate their very precious resources. We all kind of have the same objectives here, but there are some times that it takes longer to get traction there. And sometimes my team has to take it one for the team here and have, have more status conversations with the customers and deal with that while we're getting engineering spun up, which could take a while. It depends on what's going on. And it's not a comfortable place to be in, but sometimes that's what we have to do for the team. So since I've run engineering, I have quite an understanding of what it takes to pull engineers off of product features and put them onto maintenance. I like it best when there's a number of hours allocated or a percentage. I like 20%. Yeah. I don't always get 20%. Yeah, I, and I, we can just I, fill that with what we think is most important because we're talking to the customer. Yeah, I, I, I have a theory. Best engineers make best customer success people and vice versa. If they decide to kind of go there, you should actually have, do all those roles because you will understand what your customer success person goes through for every piece of code that you're writing in your in your app. Yeah. As a matter of fact, didn't Tony Shea, who is unfortunately no longer with us at Zappos, uh, that was his model. Every Everybody who joins the company must play a customer yeah. success role. What's fascinating to me is that, and Lisa, you touched upon this trade-off and it's, it's a struggle for me for last 20 years in product development. Sure, same thing for you and Nalima. But like Amazon.com, the e-commerce company kind of proved that it, that doesn't need to be a trade-off in the sense that they're extremely customer focused and it's worked for them and they haven't changed the freaking checkout button in the last 20 years. So they haven't introduced a lot of cool new features. They've just remained focused on customers, delivered incremental value, and it's worked out really well. And I think we all can learn a lot that rather than doing new and going after new stuff, if you just make your existing customers happy, they're going to help you grow your business. Oh, I love the Amazon experience. I can talk to, if I, I don't often want to talk to anyone at Amazon, but the few times I've had to, they have, on, I can talk to them in a minute. It's fast. Yeah. They're going to call me right back. And guess what? They're going to solve it. I mean, there was one time I had something and they're like, okay, you don't want it. We'll just credit you, but you just keep it. You don't even need to send it back. I'm like, who does this? But they've already done the calculus on whether or not it was important enough to send back or not. Anyway, it was some small item, but they make me happy all the time. Yeah. Lisa, we live in a world of automation. You wrote recently a blog about why human touch is still very important to the CS role. Give us your perspective on that. Right. So it's both. As I've talked before, anything that you can automate, you should. 
any kind of diagnostics, any kind of configuration setup, any kind of self-help, automate, automate as much as you can. Let the customers self-serve everything they can. But then there's a time they need to call you. And I do this for the top customers. And what we did is we relaxed a little bit, put some more people on the line. So funny. Put some more people on the line for the top customers. Yep. And now that they're not rushed, they asked a few more questions and they could wait for send me the log file instead of saying, oh, just send it and attach it to the ticket and I'll call you when I get it. They wait those two or three minutes. They see the log file come in. Oh, it's not the right one. Get the other one. You can imagine the power of reducing the time on the issue. And don't forget, your employee's time is as important as your customer's time. And the more you make them kind of multitask or jump from, we call it thrashing, go from one activity, stop that to another activity, right? Reload to another activity, you're losing time. If they can just stay in that activity or that thought space for a little longer, help the customer through it. The customer's getting faster response. You're getting more efficient use of your resources. You don't realize this at first. So we started to reduce the time to solution. And we start to measure this. We have kind of an important measurement. The first day you call with an issue, did we solve your problem with the same engineer that day? Mm. That started to go up, right? And we want it to be around 60% of the time, right? So we could see it go from like 48 to 55 pretty quickly, and it was reaching 60. And the customers were thrilled. The employees were thrilled. Like, let's not forget we need to make their jobs. They need to have employee success and employee happiness too. I can see their happiness in their employee surveys with some of the best employee surveys at the company. The customer started writing in their CSAT comments the names of the analysts, the support analysts that were helping them. We love that. The team loves it. So everyone benefited and they just became slightly more efficient. So I did put a few more people on. So there's a little extra cost, but my CSAT scores went to 98%. Who? Very, very high, right? And the customer was, their, their problems were solved faster and the employees were happier. But I did that because I really automated that long tail and we could move them there. It was a great experience, but sometimes you have to show up like that. You cannot just, everything just can't be automated. Yeah, love it. Couldn't agree more with it. One last question on customer success. And I know, you know, we can talk customer success all day long, but you've got so many other superpowers and we've got limited time. So I got to ask you questions in other areas, but what's like people talk about CSAT and NPS, et cetera. Like what are the, has the industry still remained in terms of measuring the customer temperature? Is it still the same thing? NPS, CSAT, like what have you, you know, what have you seen? What should people measure really in terms of understanding if the customer is going to renew or churn? So for me, CSAT tells me if my individual teams, training, professional services, tech support, customer success, how they're doing individually. And that's helpful. Uh, NPS tells us how the company is doing. Would you recommend this company? You care about both. But I'll tell you the other one I look at, show me the dollars. Like I want to see sales increasing and I want to see a really, really strong renewal rate. I mean, to me, that all of that draws the picture. Well said. So kind of switching gears a little bit, you know, you spent a decade at Oracle and we want to understand sort of what you learned there and the areas of specific interest are how to thrive in a highly competitive environment like the one at Oracle and grow both personally and professionally. Like what are some of the, I know you were not too far away from Larry Ellison. So you, you must have seen him in action, but give us some insights on sort of the culture and how did you succeed there? I will, but I, I'm going to try and ask you for your advice on this one too, because I think you were both acquired by yeah. Palo Alto Networks, right? So yeah. let's, let's play it both ways, right? Yeah. So yeah, Oracle, very big company, over 90 acquisitions. We were, I was one of them. And it's hard to know how to make your way at first. I would say that you have to, at Oracle, you have to self-select to try it. Hmm. Um, I remember when we were first acquired, they don't believe in plants in the office. So they came into the Golden Gate offices and all of a sudden the plants were gone. <laughs> I mean, it felt rough, but it's just, they have a standard playbook. There's only like two options in the entire playbook. Get your head around it. Don't try and fight it. It's not, it's useless. It's useless. And look, they've been very successful. So I say this with all due respect. Yeah. for the Oracle approach, right? We know they've been extremely successful. 
The other thing I did is I made the move into an Oracle office early. I decided that I, if I stayed at the Golden Gate offices, I wouldn't pull myself out of the, oh, we don't like this right now kind of mentality. If I went to Oracle, I would just start to, to give them a chance. And that's what, that's the first thing I decided to do. I thought I'd give them a chance and see how it went. And so that was one step. And maybe you could comment on this. I mean, what did you guys do when you were first acquired? How did that feel? Palo Alto was not known to acquire a lot of companies, but the acquisition, at least the one that I came from, was pretty smooth. And fast forward to today, kind of the idea is that startups were successful in the way they were doing things. So why would we change it? So there was some assimilation in terms of culture, but by and large, these startups are what's called speedboats now. So that model has kind of paid dividends uh, yeah. so far. For me, this was the second acquisition. Uh, so the first one I had worked in with was McAfee, was a serial acquirer as well. The same thing with Paul Alter Networks, very, very smooth. And we were really excited because we, we knew that we had the tech and now we were going to get the growth engine. The other thing I think that has really helped us is our leadership is extremely clear when they acquire the companies where, how, and when we are going to integrate it. So the culture and the go-to market just kind of works. Plus the culture is very nice. It's just exciting to have 15 plus startup people in the same space. Did you learn any lessons at Oracle or otherwise on managing up? I mean, you know, fierce battle, probably a lot of politics, just like every other company. Any insights into it? Like a lot of people who are in sort of that mid to high career, but now they want to go to the next level. What are some of the things you learned there? Maybe two more important lessons. There were many important lessons. One is kind of know what you want to get out of this experience. I wanted experience at scale. I had already been in a small company. I wanted to get experience at scale. And so that's what I went after at Oracle. I did customer success at scale, and then I did renewals at scale. And those were two missing pieces in my career to be a chief customer officer. So I had some intention around that. I didn't think Oracle was going to be the place for me long-term. So I think you have to have intention around what are you going to go after? The other is, you know, there's a, there's a component from work of what you get out of it. Look, Oracle was not big on the Kumbaya meetings. There weren't all these all hands and we're going to tell you how much we love you. They were really, so I didn't mind that because it's a very sincere approach to be quite frank. I liked it. They were very focused on here's the work you need to do and you do it and we'll reward you. I really liked that too. That made it really clear and simple. And my best relationships were with my peers across the company. It was easy to make those relationships. And again, it's what you make of it. And then probably the last piece is manage what you can. Like I didn't have complete discretion over everything in the renewals depart area. Now, again, it was multi-billion dollars I had to deliver on time. But those pieces that you can, be sure you manage them correctly. Be sure you take advantage on how you can turn these dials or change things and make the business um, adjust and change in the way that it needs to um, and not sit back and go, well, renewals would be fine if I just but had the professional services team attached to me. Then I could really, no, no, none of that thinking. Do take what you have and make the best of it. How do you make the best of what you have? Do you need to understand how to navigate organization? What are some of the things to keep in mind? I'm often try to get issues out of the way of my team in advance. Mm -hmm. And I'm always thinking, what relationships do I need to have before an issue comes up? So the head of database support, for example, I, my customers would have could have tremendous database issues. I wanted to know the head of database support along with maybe a few of their lieutenants and have, have some regular touch point and have built some relationship in advance of the time I need them. Now, it doesn't always work that way. It doesn't. And sometimes you need to get them on the phone and say, look, this customer really, really needs your help and here's why. But you need to have the why, the business approach, like it's, you can't always rely on, you've already set up a relationship, but you can often rely on, we can speak the same language. If you can explain to me why it is important and what you've done and how you've tried to solve it. And if I can give them a little bit more runway to solve it, which is the other thing, I always want customer issues as early as I can get them. If you think I may need your, you may need my help because the more runway, the more things I can bring to the table to help solve the problem. The biggest issues I've often seen have been late escalations and then 
there's nothing I can do to get something delivered in an emergency really, really quickly. Switching to another topic, which is fairly hot nowadays, pay disparity among women, uh, a big issue, and a lot of LinkedIn posts around that. Negotiation skills have been consistently called out as a reason of why we see this gap. How can women get better at negotiating better pay? This is a great topic. Let me start with you two. When you negotiate for your pay, do you think you're really great at it or just okay at it or something else? I'm I'm pretty pathetic when it comes to negotiate. I'm really, really bad. I'm learning the value of negotiation, Lisa. Let's just say that. <laughs> right. So I think I think most people would answer it just like you do. Yeah. Like, mm. and we're at a disadvantage. How many times in your career do you really negotiate your salary? Maybe it's a handful, maybe it's two handfuls, but it doesn't matter. It's really not a practice that you master. Yeah. So here's, and I speak um, on this topic with university students all the time because, and it's really around their first job. And it's just my way to start to introduce them to the practice. Hmm. And so it goes like this. You need to start to practice negotiating on small things first because you need to build your practice, right? So I need an enterprise rent-a-car in town because our car's in the shop. I'll show up, I'll ask them, do you have a special discount for the locals? I'll often get another two or $3 off my daily rate, right? I go to the dermatologist and I'm getting non-medically required procedures. I had one dermatologist up to 20% off, but you have to ask. There's three birthdays at this house in August, in my house. And this year I had this company that comes and puts like cows or hearts or stuff in the front yard. Have you seen it? Or pink flamingos, you know, they'll put like 20 in there and they'll put a little sign like happy birthday to my daughter. And um, I said, look, I'm going to order three of these one week apart. Can you give me a discount? And she said, what would you like? And I said, 20%. And she said, sure. Who would have thought that you have to start? So first of all, practice and be okay with it. Now I've been turned down and I've been turned down in some in some slightly embarrassing ways, but I'll tell you what, I am not afraid to form the question in a way that's that's consistent with who I am. So it has to be consistent with who you are. Now, the next thing is you start negotiating for your next job the minute you take the first call from the headhunter. Mm. In California, they're not allowed to ask you what you make, but at some point, some information is going to come out. Years ago, my guidance to women, and it could be to anybody, is that you lie about your salary because you're probably making not enough. And I would tell them to up it by 10%. Start at 10%, but you need to decide and you need to stick with it. And you need to write these numbers down so you don't forget them. And then you need to ask for an increase where you're going. Look, you don't look like a smart business person if you're not getting an increase. And I had a woman who came from the CIA who's in um, cyber crimes a good friend of mine, and she was interviewing with a company in San Francisco. And she said, they won't give me, it'll, it's the same pay as what I'm making right now. And I said, you can't go. She could go if there was an overriding reason, like where you are is just treats you so rotten, like you need to just be in a better space. But I said, hold, Let, but let's just see, just hold. She held, three months later, they came back with the number she wanted. It can happen. You'd be surprised. But if you don't ask for what you should get, and if you don't know your worth, you will never, ever get it. And then you need to know what's important. So I just negotiated for my salary um, at my new company. And I'll tell you what was important. What was important for me were those two weeks in Mexico. Now, of course, I needed a, I needed a, a good size salary. I mean, I needed all the other pieces in place. I was also walking away from a year-end bonus and from a retention bonus because my company had been bought by a PE firm. And I was clear with them and I was honest with them. I didn't gross this up, what those numbers were because they, need to make, they needed to make good on it. And they did. But then when we really came down to it, it's what did I wanted those two weeks. And that was a little hard for them. But it's since I made it the first thing on the list pretty much because all the other ones were met satisfactorily, I could work it in. Does that help? Oh, it yes. Uh, that's a lesson in five minutes on negotiation. You can go on. I can tell you more and more stories, but you have to get used to arguing for your value. And then the assignments that you get, you have to be sure you argue for the best assignments too. We could we could spend a whole session on this. Okay. We'll, we'll take you up on that one, <laughs> probably for one of the pods. Next question is about managing up. The b- battle at the top is fierce and you've consistently landed top roles in big companies, what do you attribute your success to? You know, I think at some point you have to become 
a storyteller, and your own marketer. You have to be able to tell people what you've done or your team has done in business terms, and you're going to have to get used to repeating it because you're going to be in all kinds of places where it needs to come through this way or that way, or it's a different group, a different audience, and you have to become okay with it. It's a little bit like practicing for negotiation. You have to start to tell the story. So if I was going to tell the story of my past company where we increased CSAT, my first opening line would be, I have the happiest customers on the face of the planet. My CSAT scores are at 98%. Now, look, it's a little sensational, but you get the point. You've got to make it interesting. You've got to use the numbers. It has to be factual. It has to come from a sincere spot. And But you have to be able to tell that story almost every quarter or every week or every month. And you have to get used to it. It has to be in your status reports. It has to be how you open meetings. You have to you have to tell your team how they did. Let me just tell you all what you just did. You have the happiest customers on the face of the planet. Let me show you what this large telco said about Encore, our support engineer. They said, even though the product's hard to work with, Encore was amazing and made it work for us. So okay. you've got to keep telling these stories. And then that helps sell you. But it also, look, it gives the, the team esprit de corps. It gives you something to brag about. When you're interviewed, so we could go back to this, and you're trying to get that next job, you will have those in the back of your mind because you've said them so often. They're going to be very natural. Okay. Very well said, yeah. I think a lot of a lot of leaders are just striking a balance between kind of managing down, managing sideways versus managing up, kind of having a healthy mix on your path to way up. That's always the hard trade-off, and there are no right or wrong answer. But certainly one big aspect is to make yourself visible, which is, I think, something you've talked about quite often, actually. Awesome. So we are, I've got a couple more questions and then we move to rapid fire. So you obviously recently switched a role. The world doesn't know about it. Drum rolls, please. And we will be the first one to announce uh, your next gig. So, so first of all, I'd love to learn what you're going to be doing next. But, you know, switching career is always hard. And people often don't know when to push through the adversity and stick to the current role because that's the comfort zone versus actually make the next move. So A, why did you decide to move? And B, what are you going to be doing next? Yeah. Now, there's a number of changes at the company. And I would say that the direction, and there were just a number of changes. And I guess I decided it was time and I was open because of these changes at the company. I was open to conversations with others. Got it. And once you're open to conversations with others, then you can, you start to daydream about, well, what would it be like there? So to say that I'm now the chief customer officer at Blackline, and they're a SaaS company that helps many companies, there's over 3,000 customers, do period end close, automate period end close. Now, it doesn't sound as powerful or as sexy, perhaps, as cybersecurity, but let let me guarantee that it is, because these accountants worry about trying to close the books across a variety of different financial accounting software products like SAP, like NetSuite, like others. And it's often so manual and time intensive and difficult to get the best answers that we have an approach to automate all of that and all of the inputs and the, the reduction in time and the increase in accuracy has been amazing. Um, you can see the company's growth. They're publicly traded under the symbol BL. And I'm thrilled to work with them. And the primary part of their DNA is the customer. Nobody, they talk about the customer and they deliver on it. I can't tell you how many, how many companies talk about, yeah, yeah, we care about the customer. And then you look under the sheets and you're like, well, but what, what do you mean? Like you say it, but are you walking the talk? Blackline does. And so it's great to be somewhere where they care so much. And I've just finished my first week there. The announcement will come out next week. And it's completely delightful and completely truthful and completely sincere and hardworking. And I can't wait to work with them and be part of the team and help lead them forward. Well, we're going to lead each other forward together. It's a great team. Love it. Well, congratulations on the on the role. I mean, I've since we met, I've obviously done my own uh, research on the company and they've been doing some really, really interesting thing. And I know you're going to crush it there just like you did at Force Point and Oracle and all the previous company. So, so congratulations. Well, last question is, uh, I'd love to know from you, what other life lessons do you have for our listeners? And I know, you know, you're raising kids in a interracial family, obviously, and you had some you know, nice advice for parents as well. But in general, what tips and tricks you have to, to live a meaningful, happy, successful personal and professional career? Yeah. So I think don't give everything to the job. You need to save some for you. 
Don't give everything to the family either. You need to save some for you. I think that my family is happier when, and I know I'm happier when everybody in the house is happier. So that's an important piece. I think not being afraid to get, we talked about getting a skin knee and I read the book, The Blessing of a Skin Knee. There's also a book out there called Free Range Kids. I don't know if you've ever read that. Um, it was a, a journalist in New York City. It's a very interesting story. It could be for another day. But she wrote a book where she lets her, she let her child take uh, the subway midtown Manhattan to school every day. And, you know, how people found this to be really offensive. And she's like, wait a minute, if they don't start doing the small things and have smaller challenges, they'll never have the bigger challenges. You'll never become the CEO of a company if you haven't tried and failed in other places first, right? Or any of our roles, right? So you have to, so what I always tell people is I'm fine if you skin your knee or any of that stuff. I'd like you not to break your leg. Like we're going to try not to have those experiences, but let's go and try some of this, right? And let's, you know, with my kids, I let them take BART. It's been a big discussion with my husband though. Um, he didn't like it, but I taught, I, we taught them how, we taught them how to be safe. These are things that you need to do. So I think it's find time for yourself, help grow those around you. And then of course, this part about being the best you can be in terms of health, balance, strength. There's times that you just, and you need to, again, saving some energy. I'll often tell women, you need to be able to find your warrior when she needs to appear. And yes. she may need to appear at times that you're not interested in. You may say, look, I had a, my warrior had to come out when I was on vacation. It's a long story. And I was, you know, sitting by the poolside and I realized I had a big problem back in California. I had to get on the phone and start to deal with it. And I didn't want to, but there was no choice. Like sometimes you just have to step up. And so save a little energy and be ready to step up and be the warrior you need to be from time to time. Yeah, amazing lessons. And I, I can learn some of the, the things from here. We have a discussion about house chores between my young ones all the time. So <laughs> I'll be taking some lessons from here. With that, Lisa, we'll go into the rapid fire. So you ready? I'm nervous about it, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Which consumer or B2B company is the gold standard for customer service? I think it's Amazon. It's Amazon. If you had to spend a week with any past or present leader, who would that be? Uh, Abraham Lincoln. If customer success was not on the cards, what else would you have made your career in? I would have been a customer. I would have stayed as a CIO. Favorite vacation spot? Oh, I have to say it's the Yucatan in Mexico. I just came <laughs> back. Um, it was completely relaxing and wonderful. Travel solo or with the family? Uh, solo. Wow. Okay. With that, Lisa, we want to thank you for coming on the pod and congratulations again. Good things happen to good people. We really wish you all the best at Blackline and hopefully we'll have that follow up on the negotiation once you've settled down. Thank you very oh, much. I, I'd, I'd love to come back. And I want to thank both of you. You have been wonderful, wonderful interviewers, great, insightful questions. You brought a lot of your experience to make this better for your listeners. And I know that they appreciate it. And I really appreciate getting to know both of you. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Appreciate you coming on the show. Bye now. Bye.